Greetings and welcome to Q&A with Andrew Carlson and the rest of us tonight. So we're going to answer some questions and we're hopefully going to put out some questions to you that you can maybe find out for yourself. But also the questions that we have are given to us by people that are either listening here online or have sent in questions from Quorum. You can join us. Yes, you can join us on Friday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern Time on your Zoom meeting client. And all you need to do is surf to theyahad.com, T-H-E-Y-A-H-A-D.com, and you're there. Wouldn't that be great? On uh, YouTube, lots of people download this show every week. Every week. So... Uh, you want to be on it? Let's do it. Maybe we'll go over to YouTube Live or something like that pretty soon, and we can get a bunch of people on here. And I hope that's the case, because this, this has been really fun. Wouldn't you say, Andrew? Yeah, I think for YouTube Live, I, I'm not sure if there's different ways you can do it, but from what I understand, it's a one-way thing. I don't think you can do a video conference on YouTube Live. You can. Through you can? You run through Zoom first, and then you go through YouTube Live. Well, I don't know how any of that works. So. I looked it up, yeah. I don't either, but I know that you can do that. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Uh, nobody can throw tomatoes or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome here. Glad to have you, definitely. Is there a question from the peanut gallery, or shall we take one out of the big box? Why they're, while they're possibly thinking up of questions, I know, Jackson, you were talking about before about possible, we were, we were talking offline or off of Zoom of uh, possible different types of meetings we can do going forward. You know, you talked about the apostolic constitutions. Uh, we, could, we could do like a sort of like a co commentary or study of the apostolic constitutions, which is an apocryphal writing claiming to be written by the apostles. It is considered scripture in uh, the Ethiopian Bible. So that's a, one that I would find interesting. Jackson was the one who suggested it. Uh, but then we also talked about uh, interviews, such as interviewing Jackson, interviewing me, and possibly interviewing some of the people like uh, Laverne and anyone else who might be interested in sharing their perspective. So those are things we could figure out going forward. I don't know if we want to figure it out tonight or sometime over the weekend or something, we can try to, to talk more about it. Yeah, let's see what kind of response we get to this. And we'll put, put a few more comments up on this on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. And we we'll could do a poll or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There have been, uh, through time, as you know, there have been numerous people that wanted to do this or that. Actually, the uh, Constitution's thing was suggested by John, John Ritter. Okay. So he's been wanting to do that for a while. Every once in a while, somebody says, I want to do this for a while. But the thing is, when you get it started, you know how many I've started on this. Well, they don't show up then. Right. And I don't know what happened to people's general ability to fulfill their promises, but that's the way it is. Well, the, the Apostolic Constitution's one I, I would be interested in because I know certain people, like uh, there's this one guy, Richard, on Facebook, who yeah. um, he, I believe he distorts the Apostolic Constitution's in a sense because... So there's this, there's this desire for us to go to like the Hebraic roots of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But I think it's dangerous to take a document and, I mean, I say dangerous, but like what I mean is it's questionable to take a document and impose your beliefs into that document when it may not be what the document was saying. Like, there's, there's I was a lot with him a few times. He gave me the left foot of fellowship. But uh, there's a lot of times where you've got a document like that that 
really doesn't have a whole lot to do with Hebrew roots. What it has in there, it names a lot of Hebrew people from the New Testament, but then that's about it. It's got apocryphal sayings from them that probably were made up. Yeah, how do you put Hebrew roots to a text that's in Latin or in Greek and has nothing to do with Hebrew roots or came out after uh, after the Council of Nicaea? Well, one of the other things is that the uh, I believe the view the view of the church is very much distorted by a lot of uh, believers. Uh, so. I think if we do do the study of apostolic constitutions, uh, that's something we could discuss because the church per pervades the entire document. So if we have a false view of the church, then we might have a false view of the document. Or if the church has significantly changed in the meantime. Right. If the, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, so Laura asked a question. Um, Isaiah 14, past or future? Um, well, it's, um, I had to look it up, but the part about Lucifer is talking about a human king and that human king, uh, that was in the past. Uh, I forget the name of the human king, but, uh, I'm going to look up that pa passage now. Jackson, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I've got it right here. It's the king of Babylon. And yes, this, first of all, there is no word morning star in there, or Venus, or Lucifer. Those words are not even in there. <clears throat> Those came over from Latin and got so popular in use that they came into English that way too. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're talking about a um, particular Babylonian king, probably Nebuchadnezzar, or uh, one of the ones named there. I can't tell you exactly because I don't know when this was actually written, and it doesn't say in here, that, <clears throat> that, that this person had, like in the Tower of Babel, had tried to climb the mountain up there and steal the sovereignty of Elohim. We see this reflected in Philippians chapter 2 with the canonic hymn there, where Yahshua didn't consider the power of or a seat of Elohim to be something to be grasped or stolen. And so we, we see this guy being lambasted by the prophet, <clears throat> this king of Babylon, in a way that as though he were a demigod. Right. And, yes, I, I do not think that's for the future. I think that's for the Unfortunately, even in the version I'm looking at, <clears throat> a modern version, they're using the word Lucifer in there, which <laughs> never in there any place. Yeah, that's when you know the translations are not very original when they are um, copying those type of errors or, or at least copying that type of style. Um, so, yeah, so basically of that... Uh, whole topic, the you know, a lot of people claim based on that one verse that Lucifer is the name of Satan, mm -hmm. and that's silly. You know, um, it's clear that the Latin uh, is the origination of of the term Lucifer, and it doesn't mean anything bad. Um, uh, and in fact, I, th I think the church fathers, the church fathers, sometimes use that word for Christ, for the yeah. Messiah. Um, so, um, there, there's different discussions about what Satan's name might have been, but we don't know for sure. But the thing also to keep in mind is that the way we view names as humans is very different than the way names are originally. Like, names originated originally as function, relationships. So, like... Raphael. Why was he named Raphael? Because he was the a angel appointed over healing. And Gabriel, you know, I think it's Gebar means like strength or something along those lines. Gabriel was appointed over those things. Uriel appointed over the light. Um, and Michael 
I'm not sure what he would be appointed over, but each of the different watchers, for example, uh, the, uh, it lists 20 watchers in the Book of Enoch. There's one, the Shemashel, which is, which is the, uh, basically it means sun god, Shemashel. And each, each of the watchers were basically appointed over a different part of nature. There was the moon one. They're basically the moon god. So there, it was like Sarael. And let's see, what were some of the other ones? I don't know, but the, basically, you know, they, they each had uh, their, their name reflected their role. So whatever Satan's original role was, that was his name. But the name was more of a title. Just like, you know, we say king, someone is a king. Well, um, a king is a title. So, um, and many times, you know, pe people, like, people were named in the Bible. They were named after, like, uh, circumstances involving their births. Usually, often, the name was related to, like, what, what happened with the father. Like, the father experienced some type of sorrow. Or the mother, who, when she was giving birth, had sorrow. Or the child, when being born, underwent a trauma while being born. Or maybe it was a positive experience. There was joy when they were born. And these tell, these basically describe who the person is historically. That's what a name was originally. So when, when, when you ask what was Satan's name, in many ways it's almost like a, a, a um, nonsense question because his name was whatever he was appointed to whatever role he was appointed to. Be because he fell into evil, he, his name changed from a good name, whichever that name may have been, to something along the lines of, you know, we have, we have Mastima, we have Satan, we have, um, we have Beelzebul, and um, there's also Semael, so these are all, oh, Semael means um, the poison god or the blind god. So anyways, uh, there's no real evidence that Satan is being talked about. Now, we do, we do know that the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Pesher documents, do this like deeper analysis where they kind of like use like parallels and symbolism and metaphors to kind of draw out deeper meaning. So it's possible the Essenes and the apostles may have taken this passage and applied it to Satan in a symbolic, you know, extension. But they would have agreed, they would have told you that the original meaning, the intended meaning of the passage had nothing to do with, with uh, Satan, but had everything to do with this king of Babylon from the time of uh, ancient Israel. So it's not a future prophecy. It was already fulfilled. Um, it's kind of comparable to the Psalms of David. Like I've talked about before, most of the Psalms of David were David's own experience. David was not trying to prophesy of the Messiah in most of his Psalms. Like, um, my hands and feet have been pierced or whatever. He was not talking about the Messiah. And the same thing when it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's from the Psalm. He was not saying that as a reference to the Messiah. He was saying that as a reference to himself, saying that he, David, felt forsaken by God. But later on, later generations saw that, that passage and they saw, wow, this, this uh, is very reminiscent to what the Messiah went through. And it, and if we are to believe the gospel account, the Messiah related to David's experience. And he wanted to portray himself as the son of David. So he took on David's experiences and related to them and kind of fulfilled David's experiences by reliving what David went through in a sense. But we can't lose sight of what the original prophecy was talking about. And I think we make, a lot of people make that mistake. They, they ignore the original meaning and intent of the passage and make it mean something future focused. You know, some people 
some people would literally open their Bible, flip it to a random page, and the first page they come to, they'll say that, okay, that's applying to my life. But that is a very um, fallacious way to uh, apply scripture in your life. So anyways, that's my uh, take on it. Sorry, I talked a lot. Uh, Jackson, any more thoughts on this? Is he still there? Where did Jackson go? I'll be right back. Carry on. All right. Um, so let's see here. Um, I did want to say when I was talking about the translation thing issue earlier, where most Bible a lot of Bible translations use Lucifer. And that, and if, it, if you see Lucifer there, you know that they're not being very original. I'm trying to make a version of the Bible where I'm going to be freshly translating the entire Bible from scratch. And I'm actually starting the process finally. And I've been, pro, I've been prolonging this process for a long time. But I'm going to share with you guys the process that I'm doing while we wait for Jackson. So basically, the process is... First, I'm having my scribe that I pay to do scribe work for me. He will, he will start working on, he will start taking the Septuagint and Masoretic English translations, and he's going to line them up in a line and then underneath it, and he's going to underline the differences. And then I'm going to edit his work. And then I'm going to look at the Hebrew and freshly translate everything and update what's there and create a third line. This third line will be my translation and you can compare the two. You can compare basically the two versions uh, I'll be using is the King James version, which is pretty close to the Masoretic text. And then I will be using the uh, Brenton's translation of the Septuagint as the primary versions. And then, like I said, I will do a fresh translation probably do some footnotes. Um, and then I have another process where I have someone else who's going to be on my team uh, who will be sort of like reading what I, what I uh, come up with and giving commentary as well as editing remarks, such as if I make typos and they catch it, things like that. Um, so Though that's my process that I'm going to be doing, and I'm going to be, re be releasing it by book. So I'm going to try to start with the short, short books first. So short books would be like Obadiah, things like that. So uh, that is what I plan on doing. We're going, to, we're going to start in January. We will start in January. So anyways, that's the, uh, that, that's the game plan for my Bible project and the whole it's probably going to take three years, I'm going to guess, a conservatively uh, to get this whole thing done. But we may, maybe we could do it sooner. Maybe it could be like a year. So I'm going to try my best. And like I said, I'll release it as I finish the books. And I'm study I bought a lot of books recently, like Hebrew stuff, um, to study language. So Because I really want to master the languages and properly translate uh, for you guys. So, anyways, that's what's going on. All right, Jackson. Um, sounds, any uh, so, sounds great. You think you have? I'm oh, sorry. What were you saying? Oh, I was just uh, remarking that what you were doing sounds great, and it also sounds like it might take you the rest of your life. Um, it will be a on like. There will always be need to update, I'm sure, like, you know, new, new manuscript discoveries, things like that. But um, I do want to emphasize that I'm, I'm going to be, like I said, book by book, and I'm also going to be starting with basically the canonical uh, documents. So the traditional Old Testament and the new, basically the New Testament, traditional New Testament. So uh, that's going to be uh, my starting point. Because trying to use everything like um, trying to use uh, trying to do um, a version of every single apocrypha book 
before I release it would be would be forever. Like per, like we said, perhaps the rest of my life. But um, the core Old Testament, the core New Testament, we could do that pretty quickly. Probably in a year if we work really hard. But more realistically, if we're being more pacing, if we're pacing ourselves, it might take up to three years. But I'm going to release it book by book, so so it'll be good. Um, and let's see. Yeah. So Jackson, um, were you, were you going to say anything else about Satan, like Lucifer, any of that stuff? Well, there was a question about. Perry Stone's teaching about these were a certain kind of angels, but uh, how can we say yes or no to that? I, I think that the closest you can get there is in Job, where it talks about the sons, uh, the Pleiades singing together, talking about the, the planets. And one of the early understandings of planets is that in their orbits, they were something like an orchestra. They all had their own wavelength. Each of the bodies had a wavelength and they, they considered it the sound link that they were able to stay in their orbits because of their each of their wavelengths or their music. So when they talk about the music of the spheres or the the sons of Orion or of the Pleiades singing their songs. This is one of the methods that was thought that uh, the creator used to keep these planets in their orbits, almost like a machinery system. But now we, we know that these planets do have a particular radio frequency and that you can tell each one by gauging their frequency. And when they're close to, closer together, they're the two frequencies come together in a way that it can be heard here. But it, unless the earth is in the middle of the universe, what, what particular effect would planetary alignments that are millions of miles away have on the earth, except for an astrological connotation or a religious or superstitional con? Con, uh, connotation. I just don't know, except that is what I have read concerning what they believe then. There's a lot of, um, yeah, so basically, you know, one of the questions was the upcoming event on this December, um, the alignment of planets. And I think, I think there could be some significance, but I, I also don't think it's particularly significant. Um, you know, the scriptures do speak about certain signs in the last days and they don't necessarily emphasize planets aligning. They, they focus more on, you know, you see a lot in prophetic text, apocrypha text and uh, the apocalypse. You, you see um, the blood red moon, you know, the moon becoming blood, blood or there's also the darkening, darkening of the sun. We haven't really seen the sun become dark. But apparently, according to Revelation, the sun's going to lose a third of its light. Um, supposedly, a third of the stars are going to fall away. I don't know how that's going to happen. Whether it just disappears from the sky, like like it falls. Like I don't believe that a third of the stars are going to fall onto the earth. But I could believe that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these stars that seem to be in the same place every year suddenly start moving in a way that's unpredictable and the scientists are baffled by it. That could easily happen because there's so much we don't know about the universe. So it's certainly, there certainly could be some catastrophe somewhere else in the universe that we observe uh, and that we were warned about in prophecy that the, the stars suddenly fall, appears to us to fall, but they're not falling necessarily. They're just spinning out of control very fast, far away, and it looks like it's falling to the earth. But you know, like, you know the horizon, it's very far away. Um, you're, you're looking out and you see the horizon line. And when the sun is setting, it appear, the sun appears to be going below the horizon, but it's not going below the horizon. 
it's, it's, um, you know, it's like, no, no matter what system you have, because some people believe in geocentrism, some don't, but basically, um, the sun itself is not like falling, but it's just the appearance of it. It looks like it's falling. So I believe that that's applicable to the stars as well. Yeah, John, uh, John is using en encrypted language in that book. Uh, when the, he talks about stars falling or the sky falling, mm -hmm. rolling up like a scroll, the encryption is meant to say to those that could decrypt it is that the powers of nations and their, the powers of nations and their puppeteers, their <clears throat> supernatural puppeteers were going to be knocked off their thrones. And really, that's exactly what happened during that time. Stars falling, that means like, yeah, we understand what stars are these days. You know, like uh, Matt Damon, I guess he was a star one time. Uh, they're not stars anymore. They're falling. There, there's many apocryphal texts that talk about uh, the star concept. So if possible, Revelation was intending it to mean the rulers, but some of these other apocryphal texts apply it differently. I think. Um, but Laura mentioned the stars disobeying and sinning. And so I used to believe, I used to believe that the, that everything goes around the, the earth until like a month or two, no, like two months ago. I thought everything goes around the earth. But I changed my mind based on some compelling things that convinced me. Um, at the top of my head, I can't remember what those things were. But uh, if I had free time to think about it later, I'd probably remember. And we did talk about it in a previous Bible study question and answer thing a few weeks ago. Um, but basically, my understanding is that the, the orbit is how they, they move. So I used to think that, okay, not the orbit, the rotation. I used to think it was the orbit that was how they sinned and they went off their orbits, because Enoch talks about this. So I thought the stars were choosing where they go, and, and, and they were choosing their orbits, and then some of the stars decided to disobey, and they changed their orbits. But now I believe instead that what the stars do is they, they all they can control is their spinning. They can, they can control how fast they spin. So they could, they could choose to spin slowly, or they could choose to spin fast. And based on how fast they're spinning, how slow they're spinning, it could affect their, their orbits, I believe. Um, that's my theory, anyway. Um, but they can't control, they, they, they are forced to go in orbits because what happens is they get caught in a gravitational pull and the, gra and the gravity pulls the star or planet around the center that it is orbiting around. And I believe it makes a lot more sense that, that Elohim is the u center of the universe rather than the Earth. I used to think the Earth was the center of the universe. Now I believe Elohim is and that the Earth is at the very outskirts of the universe. I think the Earth is like at the edge of the universe, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and one other thing for the uh, stars, uh, that scripture talks about stars in some places, like um, the, uh, basically there's, some people believe that stars are angels and I do not believe that. Uh, there are certain, like the, the book of Enoch has a dream vision where each creature is represented by or each type of being is represented by uh, an animal or a, a aspect of creation. And so each type of nation, human nation, is depicted by a different animal. The righteous humans are depicted as bulls or lambs, whereas the unrighteous humans, the Gentiles, the unholy ones, are depicted as various unclean animals, <coughs> like... Uh, wolves and 
lions and all kinds of things. So, uh, but then there's angels or watchers and watchers are portrayed as stars. But what are archangels presented as? Archangels are presented as humans in the dream vision. So angels are humans in, the, in, the, in Enoch's dream. Humans are animals and watchers are stars. So everything in that dream vision is not what it appears to be. So I think in, in like Revelation, there might be places which make it seem like uh, stars are angels, but I don't believe that's true. That might be symbol, symbolic like an Enoch, but the reality is stars are stars. They're not, they're not angelic beings. They are, um, they are created, uh, like Book of Jubilees gives us the order of creation. All the angels were created on the first day of creation. The stars were created on the fourth day. So that's my take on it. All right, new topic, Jackson. All right. I'm trying to find one that adds some relevance to what we were talking about, but who uh, does God restore a relationship that is broken? Does God restore a relationship that's broken? Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and no. Yes and no. Good answer. <laughs> it's it's you, it's like a like that's a big question and there's no one fits all answer. I could probably give an answer. Might be good. You may restore a right relationship that is you with the help of the Almighty. There's only one person you can control, and that's yourself. Uh, consider your part in a broken relationship honestly and completely, then pray about that. Don't bug the other person about anything. There's got to be time put in between when there has been a broken relationship. Obviously, there's a reason and time will help to heal that. Don't be contacting that person all the time. Don't bug that person. Maybe later you can approach with Elohim's help. Once you can figure out what your issues are and eradicate them, if don't, the, yeah, don't do what I did in the past. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> somebody. If the fault lies entirely with the other, well, you might pray for a reunion and even set one up after a time, but you can't try to control the other person. Let Elohim deal with him or her. Remembering that the only way uh, the other person can change is, is if he or she will make an effort to do so. Let there be shalom in your relationships or continue to keep it broken. There's no reason why a person, especially when there's an abusive relationship, has to go back into that abuse time after time after time. That is a mental illness. That is a compulsive mental illness. So your, your best advice is just to stay away in, in a relationship like that and uh, not ring that bell too often and probably best never to ring that bell again. That's the way I feel about it. I've tried to do that too. It didn't work. I just, you know, you get back with somebody and it's just same thing over and over again, unless the, the people are willing to go to a counselor that can <clears throat> that can be uh, righteous about each one's problems. As far as God mending the relationship, I don't think that Elohim is going to mend any relationship unless you first have made a huge attempt to do it yourself, especially look at your own problems. I, I also have a controversial belief about about okay. uh, Elohim and what he does. I am of the view more where Elohim has minimal involvement in our lives. Yeah. Um, I'm of the view that 
he tries to stay back and basically do minimal intervention where he gives us the tools we need to be righteous. He gives us the tools we need to be, to be good. And, and that basically he lets us make our own choices. And then he gives, we all have guardian angels, I believe that try to protect us, but they only give us a layer of protection. They don't make it, they don't make us invincible. Basically, they offer sort of like a extra layer of protection. Let's say you're walking, let's say you're walking on the road and you're about to walk into a busy street and, and um, if you were to walk out onto that busy highway, you would get hit by a car. The guardian angel might nudge you to, to make a step slightly to the right of the, of the highway so that you don't get hit by the car. Or the guardian angel might um, do a brief like uh, flash or something which catches one of the driver's attention and they, and they look up and they see you in the road and they honk their horn and you're like, oh, and you get out of the, and you get out of the road. I think stuff like that happens, like, but it's like a, more of like in the behind the scenes and it's, <clears throat> and it's not a guarantee. It's just kind of like an extra layer of protection, sort of like a friend looking out for you. Like if you see, if you have your friend, if you see your friends walking in the street, you could yell out and try to help them and protect them. You might save their life, but you might not because you're only human in the same way. Angels are only angels. They can't, they're not invincible. So they try to help us. They can't always succeed. And sometimes they can't because due to our sins, our sins prevent them from helping us. So um, I, I do believe that prayers can be answered and they are answered sometimes, but I think mu much of the time they're not directly answered by Yahweh. They're, they're often answered by the angels that have been sent to us or just human messengers um, or just nature in general brings things about in harmony with people's prayers sometimes but many times people want things that's not actually good for them and and god allows it you know relate a story short story sure there seems to have been a number of angelic interventions in my life but i would say there in a person's life that's a believer, there are probably thousands and thousands of interventions, but there's, you just don't notice them. You just don't notice them. But this one time for me, I was about 19 and I was working in Detroit at, a, at one of those car factories, Ford factory. And we weren't working for Ford, but we were working outside for a contractor. And we were told to go pick up a railroad, uh, a railroad track and carry it someplace. I'm not talking about the cross beams. I'm talking about the iron track. And we had one of us on each end. The thing was so heavy, we could hardly, hardly open, uh, pick it up. It was so heavy. But as we were moving it one time, I swear, this is what I saw and I testified to. My friend fell with that thing and he fell underneath the railroad track while I was holding one end he fell under the other one and I saw that railroad track sticking out from my hand straight out with nobody on the other end sticking straight out while that friend got up from underneath that railroad track and went back to putting his hands on it again. Now, I think that was, I have no doubt. I, I, I know I wasn't seeing things because ah, I was just amazed at that. It was like time stood still. And then I talked to my friend about it right afterwards and he didn't know that anything even happened. Now, was I imagining that? No, but it was the most blatant, blatant intervention that I think I ever saw. There's a, quite a few of them in my life that I have caught and consider, well, this has to be supernatural. This has to be something that an angel's helped me with. 
especially in some traffic acts, accidents that never happened. But this one, uh, ever since that time, I had no way to doubt about that unless I couldn't believe my eyes. You ever had any kind of incidents like that, y'all? Laura says she has. Tell me about one of them. If anyone wants to share, they could uh, turn their mic on if they prefer, or they could just type it, whatever they prefer. Oh, I'd sure like to hear them. That would be a good thing if we could do it for five minutes, if anybody would consider getting on their microphone. Nobody has tomatoes tonight. I guess nobody wants to, Andrew. If, and if anyone does and it's not good enough, then you're going to be voted out. That's right. Send the stories. So, some people are, like I said, some people might not be comfortable with saying it out loud or something, but, um, or, or it, it being on recording or something. Oh, we could always disguise the voice. Well, you know, you know, the Messiah did say, keep things secret. Don't tell people. Don't tell people about it. They might be personal, too. Yeah, that's true. Um, All right. I, I did want to say that I personally believe that most experiences that people have that they claim are supernatural. Probably. Like, how do I put it? So I believe many miracles are actually just natural things that, that like, okay. I believe there is not really a supernatural realm. I think what we call supernatural is the natural realm. Uh, I, I think the supernatural realm goes under the same laws of physics. It's not a different set of rules or laws. Um, so I think if there's any miracle that happens, it functions within the science laws and not in violation of science laws. Mm -hmm. So my personal, that's my personal view that um, any miracle that happens, it may in, in fact be supernatural origin caused but it is caused by intervention in the natural world it's not a violation which goes above natural world in my opinion okay question who was wait a minute who was saint paul before his conversion jackson loves that question i love this question <laughs> i have not answered it before but i will St. Paul, at least as far as numerous scholars today know, but won't say out loud, his sister, Cypros, was married to Helchius, the temple treasurer. All right. So the Helchius family were for generations the temple treasurer in Jerusalem. That tells us a little bit about Paul himself, because Hel the Helkius family was richer than Croesus. And we read in the uh, Acts of the Apostles that Paul had a nephew, his sister's brother, son, who would have been right there if she was in Jerusalem. Her, her son was the one that told the Romans that Paul was in trouble there at the temple and stopped his assassination, or what would certainly be in his assassination. So what, what was St. Paul before his conversion? Um, uh, Epiphanius tells us that St. Paul came down from Tarsus before he was a saint in order to get married to get married to the daughter or granddaughter of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Why that's believable is just knowing who his, first of all, who his sister was, wife of Helchius, and who his parents were. Uh, his mother's name was Cypros. His father's name was uh, Antipater II. And he was of a Herodian family. So he's, he's come down to marry her in one of the things that he is given by Caiaphas, <clears throat> according to Epiphanius, is a job to do. 
get rid of these people for me, the Nazarenes, get rid of James, and you can marry my daughter. So, you know, Caiaphas was not in line with the regular priests. He was a son-in-law of Annas. So he had married Annas' daughter to become the high priest. So Paul's idea, according, you know, this what flows into this, not necessarily his idea, but was to marry the high priest's daughter and become a high priest himself. There's a, another question that is given right before this, sent in here, was uh, Paul from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, he says he was from the tribe of Benjamin, but his genealogy tells us that he was even as much from the tribe of Edom, because if he was the grandson of Salome the Great, Great Herod the Great's sister, as the genealogy shows us, and as Josephus intimates, then um, he would have had Arabian blood. He went to Arabia, which was Idumea at the time, when he was, he said he went from Damascus to Idumea or Arabia, same thing. I think just he went home to his kin to maybe even to learn something from the Holy Spirit or from the teachers there or whatever. So an answer to the question, was Paul from the tribe of Benjamin? The answer is yes on one side, on one side of his uh, family. But the other side was Herodian. So that's one of the reasons, again, feeding into the Acts account of his nephew uh, fetching the Roman army to out of uh, out of the Antonian fortress to rescue him from being murdered outside the temple. Why would they even go over there if they didn't know this guy? And then when they do come, Paul comes out and he makes confession that he is a Roman citizen. And then the head of the Romans says, well, I had to buy this citizenship. It cost me so much. Of course, that whole story is a setup in order to get you to understand things in a particular way that the author wants you to. But um, if it's coming from Epiphanius, who says that this is a teaching of the Ebionites about Paul, but it's also a teaching that the famous St. Jerome believed as well, who tells us that Paul originally came from Samaria. And in one of the exiles, his family went up to Tarsus. So there's a lot there that oh, we, we, we have to base our speculation on little dots, connecting little dots there to try to find it. And this is as far as we can get with this particular question, who was St. Paul before his conversion? Because obviously he had some big, big, big incentive to go after these guys, like the scripture says, he's in a murderous rage before he gets converted on the Damascus Road. So that's who St. Paul was, insofar as we can tell from the church fathers, before his conversion. What do you say? You know anything about that, Andrew? Well, I, I don't have a much to say on that just that i believe i don't uh share the same same view of uh the whole connection with josephus yeah, believe but that. i haven't i haven't looked into it either from what jackson has shared I believe what um, but what i do want to talk about which you sort of touched upon a little bit um is my understanding of what who someone is and um so imagine, so every generation you go back, it's another uh, set of parents. So you have two parents and both of your parents have two parents and those grandparents each have two parents 
you keep going back like that, right? And so every generation you go back, you're multiplying your ancestors by two. So your yeah. grandparents are four, great grandparents are eight, and it keeps yeah, going like that. Thousand of them in five years. I figured that out once. Say it again. There's ten thousand or more of them within five hundred years. It, it it's, doesn't go quite that high, but it, yeah, it goes like it goes like um. Well, it goes like into the thousand, like yeah, like you said, it goes above a thousand. Um, but then when you go back, like if you go back um, a thousand years, suddenly you're you're at more than the world's population. Now that can't be true. Right. So okay. what ha what ends up happening is eventually the farther you go back in time, then you start seeing converging of lines where basically. Your great, 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 great on the one side is actually the same person who is the, the ancestor on this other side. It converges. So it starts getting smaller. The reason I say all that is because you could have a person who every parent, every ancestor to 3,000 years ago is... Egyptian or Greek, let's just say Greek, okay? Greek or Roman. They are pure Gentile blood. Every single line of every ancestor line, every parent, grandparent, all the way back, except for one line. And that one line would be your father, his father, his father, his father, his father, all the way back 3,000 years. According to the Bible, that one line takes precedence over everything else. And so if that one line is Israel, then you are an Israelite. If that one line is any other nation, you're not an Israelite. So a lot of people have the misunderstanding, like I've heard this from other people, where they believe that if they have any Israelite blood in them at all, that makes them an Israelite. But that is not what scripture says because if we go by that metric, everybody in the world is an Israelite because practically everybody has Israelite blood in them. I mean, just imagine, it, it's like you only need one ancestor to make your blood a tiny bit Israelite. But that's not the way scripture goes about it. The way scripture... Out of the thousands of people, if you even have one. So say, your... it, say it again. Out of the thousands of people that make up your ancestors, if you even have one out of those thousands, then you're in some respect an Israelite. But Scien scientifically, I agree yeah, with that. Yeah. But from from the perspective of the Bible, like in a legal understanding, they didn't they didn't consider that. They they basically believed and they taught in their their laws, like you know the law of Moses and things like that, were basically inheritance comes from the father all the way down uh the tribe the tribe uh affiliation goes from the father all the way down so in my understanding of scripture there there is no um you 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 are a gentile if if your father line is a gentile line but you can become a proselyte you can join israel in that way um, but you aren't a blood Israelite. The only way you're a blood Israelite is if it's from your father line. Um, but a lot of people believe that if you have just one ancestor, that makes you a blood Israelite. And while that's true on a scientific basis, the Bible approaches it from like, so in, in genetics, there's different types of, of DNA. I actually got my DNA tested uh, years back, and there's different DNA tests. There's a DNA test that tests both sides, the mom and the father side. There's a DNA test that tests just the mother side. Mothers, 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 as far back as you can go. And then there's a DNA test that tests just the father side. It's called the Y chromosome uh, DNA test. And it only traces the father line. This is a this is a genetic uh, 
this isn't this isn't just a cultural thing, but it's actually a scientific thing where basically um, there's actually markers in in your DNA which tell you who the father's 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 is. It doesn't tell you who the father's mother is or the father's father's mother or the father's 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 mother. It gives you a very specific code of the Y chromosome and the Y chromosome is a is a straight line that's in your DNA and that straight line goes all the way back to your earliest Y ancestor in that lineage, the, the solely father line. All these other lines have mixes of, of females in them and all those female mixes um, are not recorded in the DNA code of that Y, of that Y line. There's the, there's the Y line and there's the X line. The X line is, like I said, the mother's mother's mother mother. And both of those lines are in everyone's DNA. And the Bible tells us that someone is an Israelite by blood only if their Y line is Israelite. If their Y line is anything other than Israel, they're not considered an Israelite naturally. But they can be considered an Israelite when they go through the process of uh, proselyte. Um, so that's my understanding. Well, and, uh, yeah, the reason I said that was because Jackson was talking about how half the side of Paul is one thing and the other half is Herodian. Was it the mother's side is the Herodian or the uh, grandmother's or what was it? The, the father's side of Paul. But, it, but um, was it the father's mother or the father's father? The father's father was, let's see, his um, sister's name was Cipros. His mother's name was also Cipros. He, he's going to be a half and half. Cipros, of course, designates uh, Cyprus as a place of origination. So, so, so uh, let, basically, like, so basically, um, which side? Is Herodian and which side is not Herodian? The father's side is definitely Herodian all the way up for three generations. And the non-Herodian, what would that? That would be the mother's side. Okay, so if that was the case, it would all depend on um, his father, you know, his, his great-grandfather, was he Herodian? And before that, was he Edomite? Was he yeah. Arabian? Or was he a Benjaminite? If, if he was from the tribe of Benjamin all the way back, father's father's father, father, all the way back, his earliest ancestor is Benjamin, then he's a Benjamin, Benjaminite. His, his line, like Herod the Great, were converts from Idumea on the father's side. We don't know for sure on the mother's side, although there are people in that line whose name is Cypros that were definitely Edomite or um, Edomite in ancestry. So look, do these Edomites that convert, do they take on a tribe? Or is Herod considered to be of the tribe of Benjamin? That would be the tribe closest to Arabia, south into, into the desert. I just don't know. Nobody knows. Well, let's find Paul's dead body and do a DNA yeah. test. Yeah. One other thing that you mentioned. If you consider going back 4,000 years, unless there have been people that have been created in those 4,000 years, you're talking about multiplied tens of thousands of people being your ancestors. So doesn't this make a case for the scripture, the first Genesis story where Elohim makes, manufactures men and women and he thinks they're good. He doesn't blow a spirit in them. And then have a second group of those created from Adam. I mean, where do all these thousands and thousands of people, where do they come from? 
Well, like I said, it, it, it has to converge at a certain point. If the Earth was, you know, if the Earth was created in 4000 BC and there was only one creation and that's Adam and Eve, it, it doesn't seem like there would be billions of people on this Earth by now. There's just not enough of them to get started. Well, right. suppose, so supposedly, the uh, the population was much shorter only a few hundred years ago. Yeah, I don't know how true that is because the sense, I don't know how reliable the census is were a few hundred years ago, but um, like supposedly, it was like less than half a billion only a few hundred years ago. Um, a lot of babies brought forth from angels falling every day. Angels falling over me. Oh, that's uh, all speculation. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know how Revelation, of course, you know, you, your perspective is the Revelation's been pretty much all fulfilled. Yeah. Um, if, you know how it talks about the 12 tribes, the, the sealed, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe sealed. Um, yeah. If that is a future event, um, there's, a, there's only two ways that could be fulfilled. One is DNA would have to, to, to reveal who the tribes are. So far, DNA is not advanced enough yet. DNA testing has not been advanced enough to identify the 12 tribes of Israel. So we'd have to make significant advances in DNA. Or the other alternative would be um, they would just do it by states. So basically, Israel would create 12 states, just like you, the U.S. has 50 states. Israel would create 12 states, and those would be basically the 12 tribes of Israel or 12 states of Israel. And each, whoever lives in that state would be considered a member of that tribe. That could be the fulfillment yeah. if, it's a fu if it's a future fulfillment. Well, they say that to get, a, get together 144,000 at that time would be a near impossible task anyway because there just weren't that many of them. Yeah. Much that I read. Good for me, huh? Yeah. So let's see. We got um. It's ten fifteen. Okay. Uh, Laura asked a question. Okay. Yes, I do think so, but I don't think of two fathers. I think that if Enoch is true and they angels can pull out their members, you know, and they they can do this by themselves. However, I have. A podcast about uh, a very real incident that happened to me in my church work and not that long ago that an entire community the women in the community including old women were being visited and being oh, not impregnated but let's say being raped by invisible entities. People, women in the church even admitted this. And a couple of them admitted that they invite them in because they're so lonely. They're old, their mates have been gone for years and years. And that would be a good item for you to listen to as far as a supernatural goes, because at this time I was put in a church where um, hordes of demons, hordes of invisible but corporate beings just came down in a community. And uh, the job that I had and the lay leader of the church had, who was plagued with these things, homosexual type demons, plagued with them, was to get rid of them. How to get rid of them. And I've got three 50-minute podcasts on how finally that happened and all the circumstances about where these uh, these incubus and succubus came from in the first place because it was all revealed and a lot of supernatural experiences. So if you go out to jspresents.org, if, if you got the nerve to listen to it, the name of it is Hordes of Demons Infest the Small Community. You will learn a lot, as I did, from that experience. 
You know, you know, I've talked about this before a little bit, but it's kind of funny because years ago I used to say to myself that that Jackson is like he's he doesn't accept the truths of the Bible and all the things I'd said to myself, and um, and it's funny because like I compare myself now to Jackson and I see like wow Jackson is in some things. I'm more like traditional than Jackson is. And in some things, Jackson's way more traditional than me. It's like, it's kind of funny. Like in, in regards to this topic, I'm much more, I guess you could say liberal in understanding the spiritual realm um, where I am much more skeptical of people's spiritual experiences. Um, I apply a much more, um, scientific physical explanation to a lot of supernatural spiritual experiences um if you were thrown into the battlefield as i have been and my late wife then you would have to adjust yourself because if you're not fighting them they're not going to fight you we adjust by experience. So if I were to experience yeah. certain things, I would definitely alter my understanding. Um, but I will say, I think from a scriptural perspective, that there is no evidence as well as, uh, I don't see any evidence in modern times of actual angels uh, impregnating anyone. Let there is discussion. Uh, okay. Take, uh, take uh, Hillary Clinton. That's me. What's Hillary? <laughs> She's Napoli. She's a lizard. <laughs> um, basically, I believe that the Nephilim, before the flood, Nephilim originated by literal angels having literal sex with human women as well as actual animals. And they created monsters. Many of these monsters are the are the source of the mythology stories of many different religions of the different characters of uh, different types of creatures. That's what was happening before the flood. After the flood, what does Enoch tell us? Enoch tells us that all the watchers were banned into prison. They were sent to Tartarus. They were no longer on the earth. They were put into chains. The well, they, they've been falling ever since. You think that was the end of it? That was what, an antediluvian thing that happened at one time. But trust me, if you can trust anybody in this earth on this particular topic, <laughs> they are falling all the time. And they're not just falling. They are being invited in to, to do their dirty work. And I have personally been raped by one several times that was corporate and I got the opportunity to see it, and that's how I was able to get rid of it. But um, that's part of what that story is about that I just mentioned to you. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it, because I have found out that in my lifetime, that I have met many, many people that have experienced the same thing. So but what, I, what I wanted to say is that... Um, before, from my understanding of scripture, that um, it basically indicates that there was one time when the angels, the actual angels came down. And after that time, there was no angels that did it again. But instead, the demons, they, they all died in the flood. The giants, I mean. The giants died in the flood, but the giants were left. Um, they were left on the earth to roam around the earth and then of course we know what jubilee says uh yahweh was going to send most of the demons into tartarus with the watchers but satan or mastima basically said don't do that keep at least keep 10 percent so 10 percent stayed and it is the these 10 percent which affect afflict all of mankind and these demons may in fact be uh, behind some of these experiences that Jackson and other people have gone through with certain uh, 
certain sexual type of uh, spiritual experiences that may be demonic, but from the perspective of the Nephilim, the Nephilim in particular are, are actual creatures being born from actual union. Like, like in other words, when the watchers came down from heaven, it was literal angel sperm. It was angelic. It literally impregnated the woman. Whereas what I see today, I don't see that happening. What I see is that the demons enter the bodies, they possess them, and they, they, they corrupt the DNA. They, they cause birth defects. They, they just defile the body by distorting the chemical composition of it. Uh, but they don't impregnate in the way that they did before the flood. That's my understanding. And if they do, we ha I don't see any evidence that they're doing it openly. Because before the flood, they didn't hide it. They did it in plain sight. Everybody knew it. They knew that these beings were, beset, were actual offspring of the Watchers. Whereas in modern times if that is happening no one knows about it except maybe a few people um so i think instead it's more the demons are oppressing people and polluting people's dna genetics but there's not an actual uh, uh birth that is being caused from an actual mingling from angels and humans and their DNA combining. Evidently, they can combine. Again, if you look at Enoch, we like we talked about last week. These things can combine if that if it's true and if it's literal with all kinds of different animals, even fish. Yep. And I believe that it is true. I, I think we're seeing the real. Uh, manifestation of it today well they're certainly trying to do the same type of stuff but instead they're trying to do it scientifically they're trying to create all these genetic modifications um, all kinds of abominations distorting things some really crazy stuff they're trying to do power time says he wonders if these aren't what the dinosaurs were and there are t churches that do teach that where does he say the did he get off the call? No, he's, he's here. I don't see the statement about the dinosaurs. On Zoom. The last one that's on there. He says, I wonder if dinosaurs were those offspring of the angels and animals too. <clears throat> I, oh, I got it on oh, here. Now, now it's loading for me finally. It didn't load until just now. Yeah, right. Oh, direct message. That, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Our time is about up. We got a couple well, more minutes. Well, I will say the dinosaurs. Uh, I, I think, I think some of the dinosaurs never existed because the way the way they um, create the dinosaurs is they take a bunch of different fossils and they put them together. Um, so some of that's to me uh, suspicious of how they combine it. But there, we do know for a fact there are some, there were some dinosaurs because they have found fossils intact of uh, practically the entire skeleton. So those dinosaurs are more compelling. Um, but uh, like, for example, there is evidence from fossils that like dragonflies were much larger and a lot of animals were much larger in ancient times. Uh, we know that from the fossil record. So certainly there is evidence that some of this stuff may have been caused by the, uh, nep the Nephilim. Anyways, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, Jackson, were we gonna talk about anything else? Like any plans for anything? Or we were gonna, we were gonna do the poll, right? We wanna do a poll to see, maybe we'll give some choices of what we want to do in the future. If we are gonna open up another time of, um, this type of presentation here. Yes, we'll do that in the next week and see what we can come up with. And then Sunday night, we have a Yahad meeting 
on our Shabbat service about we're doing some changes there. And I don't know, Onia, if you feel like you, you can come to that, <clears throat> you're welcome to come because we're going to talk about the uh, internet ministry. And I would, I would like you, if you can get there, to give a little talk about what we're doing now. Is so there, what there? time? That's at 9 o'clock on Sunday. I should be able to do that. Just uh, if you could send me a reminder just in case, but I'll try to remember. I think I did send you one, but I'll send you another one. Okay. Okay. And the rest of you, if you want to come on Sunday night, we're going to talk about internet ministry. We're at a time right now when uh, this could be gone tomorrow, but right now we made even a little ministry like ours made a huge inroad through internet working. So I feel like this is a time when evangelism could be done throughout the whole world for as long as it lasts. Because I don't think it's going to last that long. I think it's going to be, internet's going to be taken over by some foul power or that the grid's going to go down sometime. What do you think about that, Andrew? I hope that doesn't happen, but that very well could happen. The grid going down, crazy stuff. We don't know. With COVID, this, this year's been crazy with COVID. So after this year, I could believe anything will happen. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you all for coming on. Uh, you folks that are so faithful to this now the last month, appreciate it very much. If you, can, if you know of other people that might be interested in something like that, get their questions together and let's get them on too. And yes, thank you for the thank yous. Hallelujah. Uh, may Elohim give all the praise. Shalom. Shabbat shalom.